Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, welcome to the Plastic Plastic Everywhere webinar on plastic pollution in Ontario's water security. Um, the story of bottled water, if you were able to watch it in just before we got started, I mean, sets up what we're going to do today. Uh, we have two speakers we're very pleased to have with us, uh, Dr. Chelsea Rockman uh, from U of T and Ashley Wallace from Environmental Defense. We're gonna take us deeper into the picture that you just uh, had saw with the video that introduced this. And at the end, we're gonna talk about our campaign and actions you can take moving forward uh, with a specific focus on uh, maintaining the moratorium on new permits to bottle water in Ontario. Uh, as uh, we have pre-recorded the uh, presentations by Dr. Rockman and Ashley to ensure that we have good uh, quality transmission uh, for you. And then we're gonna open it up to a live Q&A. As uh, Megan said, please put your questions in the chat box. You can enter those into the chat box during the presentation if you like. And then we'll have a conversation at the end. Uh, so our first speaker, uh, is Dr. Chelsea Rockman. Um, we're very pleased to have her with us today. Uh, Dr. Rockman is the Assistant Professor in Ecology at the University of Toronto and the Scientific Advisor to Ocean Conservancy. She's been researching the sources, sinks, and ecological implications of plastic debris in marine and freshwater habitats for more than a decade. So welcome Dr. Rockman and we'll switch over to the presentation now. Dr. Rockman, we find your research to be very interesting and I'm hoping you can tell us some more about uh, the work you do auditing plastic in the environment and, and what you find and, and what the effect of microplastics is on wildlife and the habitat. Thanks so much, um, Mike, for inviting me. I'd be really happy to talk a bit about what we find um, locally in terms of the amount of plastic pollution that we have uh, right here at home on our waterfront. I'm gonna share my screen and share a bit about our work. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about plastic waste in our local watershed. And I wanna start by just expressing that the, the contamination of plastic pollution is big. So where I'm, where I'm coming from in terms of the issue we're talking about today, bottled water, is more about the, the material that holds the water and whether or not we find that material in the environment. And so globally, microplastic, or plastic pollution in general, we tend to find it everywhere. So this is in the ocean, this is in the terrestrial ecosystem, in the atmosphere, um, and of course in freshwater systems. And I wanna stress that sometimes it's big plastic, like a full bottle or a fishing net, and oftentimes it's broken down into these smaller pieces. And that happens because larger pieces of plastic break down into smaller pieces of plastic by photodegradation or degradation by sunlight. So how did we get here? How did we get to a time where plastic pollution is littering our environment? So I wanna take you back to this um, cover of Life magazine from just after World War II, when we were celebrating the use of these convenient single-use plastic items. At this time, we produced about a half a million tons per year. Today, we produce almost 400 million tons per year. And while some of these plastics are reusable, like the glasses on my face or the computer that I'm talking to you through, almost half of the plastic we produce are these single-use convenient items as displayed here in this cover of Life magazine, celebrating this new era of convenience. But this new era of convenience has not been sustainable. So I wanna talk through a little bit about the management of these products. So we have produced more than 8,300 million metric tons of plastic over the years. Some of it's still in use, as I said, some of it is recycled, less than 10% in total. Some of it is incinerated, but the rest either goes into landfill or is discarded, discarded directly into the environment as litter. Now you might think here in Canada, well, how much could possibly go into the environment as litter? We have these amazing waste management systems and people pick up the trash outside my house every day or at least every week. But the reality is we have our own problem here and it's because some of it is littered and sometimes our system isn't perfect. 
So scientists predict that about 10,000 tons of plastic enter the Great Lakes every year. Here, sitting in Toronto, where I do my work, I want to spend some time focusing on the Don River. The Don River is one of the, the largest, most urbanized ri rivers um, in Ontario, but also, of course, in Toronto. It brings lots of contaminants into Lake Ontario. And so we study it. We study how it's impacted in terms of the ecosystem in the river. But we also study um, what it brings to the lake. So here I'm showing you some data from just one day where our lab went to uh, the Keating Channel, which is the end of the Don River, and we collected the litter that had collected on a boom. This is the amount of debris that had collected over a two-week period. What I want to show you here is that we find lots of styrofoam pieces, lots of hard plastic fragments, and our number three item is plastic water bottles. We found 187. And our number four item is plastic bottle caps. Then you see food wrappers and other types of single-use materials and, of course, uh, kids' toys that, of course, end up in the river. So here's the large plastic coming down. Now, once it enters the lake, it's hard to tell where it comes from because you can't see the product anymore. As it breaks down over time into smaller pieces, instead, we quantify microplastics. So what I want you to focus on here in this graph it's just that the bars show you where microplastic is, and the size of the bars show you where more microplastic is, the Toronto Harbor being quite contaminated. And 50% of these particles are fragments. So they're these broken down pieces of these consumer products, which will include the bottles, also uh, packaging and other types of material. And if you find them ubiquitous in the water, unfortunately, you find them in the fish. So we see evidence in our lab of sometimes hundreds of pieces of plastic pollution in an individual fish. This includes microfibers from our clothing, but it also again includes these fragments broken down from larger items, which will include again those single use products. So for me as an ecologist, I care about what this means for the fish because I love wildlife. But as a human, we also think, what does that mean for us? We eat fish. Well, we also drink water. We pull our water from the lake and we pull sport fish sometimes from the lake. So by nature of a contaminated source water for some of these resources that we consume, we also are contaminating some of the resources that we consume. So we know that there's microplastics in our drinking water. And again, I'm an ecologist. I don't really study this. So I had a, a grad student that said, well, is it in our tap water? And I said, oh gosh, I, I, don't, I don't know. And she said, well, can we turn on the tap and filter it? So these pictures are the microplastics that we found from the tap in our very own lab. And as we dug into the literature, we found that yes, it's quite common for microplastics to be in drinking water. It may vary from a tap water to a bottled water. It's coming through the tap, from, of course, water is treated, but it doesn't always get all of the microplastics out. So coming from the lake, you put it in a bottle, now you're adding maybe bits from the plastic lid or the plastic container itself. So what does this mean? Well, the impacts can be physical in that they can, I mean, in a, in a large animal, they can be entangled. But we know that these small particles, if small enough, can transfer outside the gut into the tissues or bloodstream of organisms. We see this in fish, we don't know yet what happens in humans. The impacts can also be chemical. We know that plastics are made of lots of different types of chemistries from additives uh, that make them colorful to bendy to more um, uh, durable, maybe especially so they don't break down in sunlight. And these chemicals, there's some evidence that they can transfer from the plastics into the organisms that ingest them. I know this more from studying fish but it raises questions that need to be tested about how it impacts humans. So in summary, we, we do not currently make, use, and or waste plastics in a sustainable manner. Started talking, talking about how much plastic we produce and what we do with it at the end of life. There is widespread contamination of plastic in habitats and animals across the world, and this includes right here in our Great Lakes and in the tributaries that feed them. And microplastic contamination has led to microplastic contamination in our drinking water, which is something we're talking about today. So of course, 
we need more science. We always do to answer more questions about harm to better understand things. But scientific facts should also inform solutions. And right now we have enough science to begin to mitigate now and prevent future sources of plastic pollution. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about anything I discuss, and of course, those relevant to the topic of today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rockman. Well, that's a lot to digest, and it's quite a range of impacts that you've described. And, you know, at the Wellington Water Watchers, we're very concerned about uh, Nestle's water bottling and the amount of uh, plastic that is produced and winds up as litter in this landfill from their work. And in some ways, uh, I'm seeing it's part of a, ver of a, much, of a much bigger picture. Um, a couple of questions come to mind for me. Uh, there was quite a difference between the amount of microplastics in tap water and in bottled water. And it's a deep concern that it's in uh, tap water. But, I, but what I'm taking from what you're saying is a bottled water is, a, is not a better alternative to tap water to, in terms at least of microplastics. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I think some people have this idea that, that buying bottled water is safer and maybe free of certain contaminants. And here we're talking, you know, at least what I'm talking about are microplastic contaminants. Well, I guess we shouldn't be super surprised that when the bottle is made out of polyethylene terephthalate, a type of plastic, and the cap is made out of polyethylene or polypropylene, another type of plastic, that these, these types of plastics over time, as we open and close the bottle, expose it to the sun, start to shed into the bottled water. So bottled water just kind of provides another pathway, I guess, to contaminate the drinking water um, with microplastics. I can see how microplastics get into Lake Ontario, for example, and get into the tap water. When, the, when a company like Nestle is taking the water from the ground, from the aquifer, will there be microplastics in the aquifer? That's a good question. I didn't, I didn't talk about microplastics in uh, groundwater. So there's several papers that have been published over the years about microplastics in drinking water. They range from looking at bottled water to tap water that's pulled from, from a reservoir, like a Great Lake or, some, or something that's been dammed, to um, water that's pulled from the ground. And by and large, the water that's pulled from the ground has much lower to trace concentrations of microplastics in it. So if that groundwater is then being used to make bottled water and there's plastics found in the bottled water, that's good evidence suggesting it comes from the bottle where it may be more tricky when you're pulling it from Lake Ontario, where that water comes from a contaminated lake. Now that brings another question to mind for me because there has been a lot of uh, discussion in the media about this. And of course, Nestle and other bottled water companies uh, appear to me to be wanting to minimize uh, the information about microplastics in bottled water. And in your chart, I saw that on average, the amount of uh, the particles of um, microplastics in bottled water is up to 6,500 particles on average, something like that. And yet Nestle, uh, for example, in their official statements say they're not detecting microplastics uh, ab above trace levels. So can you describe that to me? I mean, what on the one hand, we have the evidence that you provided to us about uh, and others have provided about the research that's been done on microplastics, the volume of part microplastic particles in bottled water, and we have Nestle saying they're not detecting it and it's in trace amounts. Can you describe that discrepancy to me? Yeah, so I mean, so my job as a scientist is to, is to look at the body of literature, right, the weight of evidence that may discuss whatever question it is. Why is the sky blue to how much microplastic is in drinking water? I go through the body of literature and I look at the averages and I look at the quality of the literature. So first of all, um, everything I'm looking at goes through peer review. So it, it's written up, it goes through some scientists that read it, uh, anonymous, anonymously comment on it, and it gets published in the literature. Even within the peer reviewed literature, the data varies. And the reason for that is because different people use different methods, right? In our lab, we use techniques that can go down to 
you know, measure down to a five micron particle. In another lab, they might use techniques that can only measure up down to a 300 micron particle. We know that there are more of smaller particles than larger particles. So the data is gonna vary based on the technique used. I don't know the technique that, that Nestle or other industries are using, but this can cause a data discrepancy. And that's why it's so important to have uh, several different labs around the world measuring these things and putting the literature together to say, here's the body of evidence versus here's this one piece of evidence. So one aspect of this is the, is the uh, methods and the technology that's available for them to use. And, you know, if the consumer reads somebody like Nestle saying that they're only detecting it at trace levels, should we feel comfortable with that? Should that be reassuring to us? Well, so I'll say that one thing that is uh, reassuring to me is that in the state of California, and we're discussing this as well in Canada, but in the state of California, they just passed a law that says, we need to start measuring microplastics in drinking water and it has to happen by a standardized method and, it and, a, and a standard definition of what microplastic is. And so right now it's hard to, to know like what does trace even mean, right? And that's a question I would ask is, is what are those concentrations? What are we calling trace? What size are you measuring down to? Um, so for me, I think I'll be most comfortable with data from drinking water once these methods are standardized, definitions are standardized, and um, objective laboratories are doing the work. So contra outside labs. Yeah, I find your use of the word independent really important here. And, um, you know, I'm reminded of, uh, I know you're familiar with this, the book called The Merchants of Doubt, which describes the historical pattern of corporations really exploiting the concept of scientific uncertainty to conduct their own research and to um, put out information that in a sense really is to inoculate the public against uh, worrying. And we've seen this everything from back in the day about uh, uh, the effects of cancer, pardon me, the effects of tobacco, the cancer causing effects of cancer through a variety of other issues up to and including climate change today. So uh, I don't, you, you may or may not have a comment on the thing I'm saying right now, but that's why I draw out. It's, I think we have to pay very close attention when companies like, like Nestle say they're only uh, detecting trace amounts because, as you say, there are different methods that are being used. We don't know what methods they're using, uh, that their methods, uh, that we really need to have independent scientists doing this work and making just judgments on this. I don't know if you have a comment or you just want to... I know that you're familiar with the whole Merchants of Doubt. Perspective. Yeah, I definitely read the book and um, and I'm, yeah, I'm very familiar with it. And I think this is why it's so important. As you said, we need independent labs. Sometimes you need multiple labs, send the same samples out to multiple places and, and see what the data is because, um, and of course, be able to read what are the methods um, that go into collecting that data. So as a scientist, I always ask more questions. Uh, Dr. Rockman, I just have two more questions. And uh, in 2017, which is the year for which we have the most recent information, uh, Nestle um, took bottled 1.7 billion liters of water. And some water is used in the production process. And if we were to assume that all of that water was packaged as a 500 milliliter bottle, if we made that assumption, um, then more than two and a half billion bottles, plastic bottles, were produced by Nestle in Ontario in 2017. And we know that 50% of that winds up as landfill or litter, adding pollution to the environment. And I'm wondering, you know, we're pushing for the uh, uh, Ontario government to phase out permits to bottle water in Ontario. And I'm wondering, what difference do you think it would make to wildlife and to human health in Ontario if the provincial government were to end the policy of giving permits to take water for bottling? I can say that, um, I mean, when you looked at the data that I showed from the Don River, plastic bottles and then their caps were number three and four of what we find. And if you look at beach litter data from around the world, um, our data is not unique. And so certainly you're removing a source of plastic to the environment. And I can tell you that when Canada banned microbeads in face wash, 
we saw a decline or we see a decline of microbeads in the Great Lakes. And so that bill worked, right? We can see that in our, in our um, ecosystems and in our wildlife. And so I would say that, you know, by doing this, this is one way. And you're also seeing smaller grassroots movements where, for example, the Royal Ontario Museum or other local places, they're saying, well, we're just not going to sell bottled water. We're going to give you a drinking fountain where you can fill up your bottle. You can buy a reusable mug here if you need, or you can borrow one. Um, but we're not going to sell the bottle that makes the waste that we see in nature. So I hear you saying that it would improve uh, habitat and human health and wildlife health. The data suggests that it should, yes. I'm going to ask you one more question, and this is uh, this question, pardon the pun, comes out of the blue because you said it earlier in the conversation that scientists ask, will, will answer questions like, why is the sky blue? So I have to ask you, why is the sky blue? Don't ask me that question. <laughs> I'm an ecologist. I don't know. <laughs> if, it doesn't, if it doesn't breathe, eat, and drink water, I know less about it. <laughs> okay, well, we'll have to find another scientist to answer that question. Thank you very much, Dr. Rockman. Problem. Thank you. We wanted to start with uh, a very close view. We looked at microplastics and bottled plastic water bottles. And now we want to expand to, uh, you know, the 30,000 foot view of plastic pollution in Canada. And Ashley Wallace from Environmental Defense is going to speak to that on our behalf. Welcome, Ashley. Hi everyone, and thanks for having me, Mike. Um, it's great to be here today. Um, so I'm Environmental Defense's Plastics Campaigner, um, and I lead our work to eliminate plastic waste, both in Canada um, and with a additional specific focus on Ontario. Um, if you're not familiar with Environmental Defense, Environmental Defense is a leading advocacy organization, and we work with government, industry, and individuals um, to, uh, ensure clean water, a safe climate, um, and healthy communities. Um, environmental defense has been working in the plastic space for about five years, um, and in the last few years we have expanded our focus to include um, national action because the federal government has demonstrated a willingness to um, regulate plastics nationally. So I am going to share my screen with you. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that. I see nods, I think. Okay, great. Um, so the proliferation of plastic in our environment has been called one of the defining features of the Anthropocene, um, which is a geological area era defined by human impact on the environment and the planet. I'm sure many of us have seen photographs like this, piles of plastic waste along shorelines or in landfills, um, but the issue is not just an issue that's far away, it's also something we see in our own communities. So in 2016, a study was done to identify the amount of plastic waste that was ending up in the Great Lakes. Um, it's estimated that about 10,000 metric tons of plastic end up in the Great Lakes every year. Um, the study was also particularly concerned with where these plastics were coming from. So you can see in the diagram, these yellow spots are kind of the hot spots in the lake. Um, and they're definitely located near um, urban areas. So Chicago is kind of over there on, um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but over here, this is the Chicago area. era area, And then Detroit, you're getting a whole bunch of uh, plastics that are showing up in the western basin of Lake Erie. Um, and then over, over here in Lake Ontario, you're getting a bunch of plastics that are coming out of Toronto and Buffalo. So this isn't just an oceans issue, it's also um, a Great Lakes issue. And many of us are familiar with the impacts the plastic have on the environment once they get there. Um, plastics harm wildlife. They can uh, ingest them and starve. They can get caught in them and drown. Um, they can end up suffocating. Plastics 100% are harmful to the environment and animals. But a lot of us also forget um, that there are other impacts of plastics from production through to disposal. So um, about 99% of plastics are currently made from fossil fuels. Um, it's estimated that about 12% of global oil demand is actually for plastics, and that's expected to increase as we see fossil fuel companies looking for new markets for their material um, as we move away from fossil fuels for our vehicles and electricity needs.
And our uh, recycling and management of plastic is also problematic. Uh, in Canada, we currently only recycle about 9% of our plastic waste. Um, and the rest ends up landfilled or incinerated. It's also important to remember that we actually export about 12% of our recycling. Um, and we are usually exporting that plastic to countries that have poor infrastructure. And so a lot of that recycling ends up contaminating the environment in another country, um, or it might actually be burned in an open field, releasing toxins into the air, water, and soil. So as I mentioned earlier, environmental defense has been working on plastic issues for a number of years. Um, we kind of first started off uh, targeting beverage bottles. And this is for a few reasons. Um, there's a solution to kind of help get us get plastic bottles out of the environment which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but also because we know that plastic bottles um, are really problematic in the environment and they're a very commonly found item when we do um, litter picks. So as you can see here, plastic bottles and bottle caps are two of the 10 most commonly found items in shoreline cleanup events um, in Canada. And we have a particular hate on for uh, plastic bottled water. Um, and that's because it's so unnecessary and so problematic. So the energy it takes to transport the water to market, to chill it, um, to collect the empties is the energy equivalent of filling that bottle um, a quarter full of oil. Um, and it's also very water intensive. Uh, a bottle of bottled water actually takes somewhere between three and 27 times as much water as is in the bottle to manufacture. Um, Ontarians love to talk about their blue box as being kind of the silver bullet uh, when it comes to managing plastic waste, but the truth is that our blue box is failing us, especially when it comes to beverage containers. Um, it's estimated that there are about 3 billion plastic bottles sold in Ontario every year. Less than half of them are collected and recycled through our blue box, um, which means that about 50% of them end up landfilled or in the environment. So it's kind of a bit of a dismal state. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, you're painting a very clear, a very devastating, but a very clear picture of the problem. Uh, you talked about the federal government. What's the role of the federal government in this in terms of managing the problem of plastic waste? So I'm gonna share my screen again. So yeah, there's definitely, Definitely a role for the federal government to play. Um, I think that role is partly in unification um, and standardization. Right now there's different rules um, in different provinces, there's different rules in different municipalities. Um, there's also a huge opportunity for the federal government to ensure that we're collecting the right data. So right now a lot of our understanding about where plastic comes from and where it ends up is based on surveys. It isn't based on actual data collection. Um, and if the uh, various levels of government are serious about hitting certain targets in terms of waste diversion or waste elimination, it's really important that we have an understanding um, of where things are in the market to start with. So in 2019, um, the federal government announced plans to ban some single-use plastics. Uh, I think that's an incredibly important piece for them. Uh, it's important not only because it would help to um, get rid of some of the most problematic plastics for which alternatives exist, but it also sends a really clear message that, um, you know, we are acknowledging that the amount of plastic we use and consume right now is not sustainable and it's not necessary. And there are some things we do not need and we need to move away from. Um, another thing that the federal government can do is mandate extended producer responsibility. So this is a system where producers of plastic are the ones who are financially and operationally responsible for collecting um, and managing their own products at end of life. And this is really important because what's happening right now is essentially a company can produce whatever packaging they want and then it falls to municipalities and taxpayers to be the ones to actually collect and try to find like an efficient way to recycle that and sell that material back into the market. 
Um, and so there's really little incentive for producers to create materials that are easily recycled. Um, and so I think not only is it important for us to see a broader adoption of this, but having kind of a unified uh, definition of producer responsibility and targets across the country is going to be really important. Um, and finally, I think they have a role to play in setting recycled content targets. And this means making sure that the plastic we're collecting and recycling is actually being turned into other goods. Because right now we end up in a situation, as I was kind of referring to with um, the deficiencies of our system that is not extended producer responsibility, is that we have a lot of material that is just garbage. Um, and there's really nothing to turn it into at the end of the day, and it ends up being um, burned or landfilled for those reasons. So Ashley, if we think about the problem of plastic water bottles, do you think it's better that we ask that um, water bottles be on the single on the single use plastic list that we ban, or do you think it's better that it somehow come under the uh, be the producer's responsibility to deal with those bottles? What do you think? I think that there is a huge opportunity for us to actually manage bottles appropriately through extended producer responsibility. I think that um, the province has the opportunity to set a high collection target for plastic bottles um, and that that would lead to us actually doing a better job of collecting them and recycling them and also potentially reusing them. So um, in the EU, for example, they've moved towards, um, they re recently released a uh, piece of legislation called the Single Use Plastics Directive, and they have stated that by 2029, all of the members of the EU will be expected to recycle 90% of their beverage containers. Um, and as a result, we're seeing a bunch of countries across the EU make commitments to implementing deposit return systems because they know that they can actually collect 90% of bottles and recycle them if they have those systems in place. Um, and not only can they recycle them, but in Germany, for example, they have deposit systems already in place for beverage containers. And a plastic bottle there will actually be sterilized and refilled 20 to 25 times before it's recycled. And so that's really the direction that we need to be going. Ashley, as you know, the Wellington Water Watchers is very concerned about the water taking that Nestle does in Wellington County, and there's several reasons for that, and one of them is the plastic production. We actually think Nestle should be called Nestle's Plastics Canada because they're really in the plastic production business more than the water production business. Um, you know, for the latest data that we have from the government in 2017, uh, all, all uh, companies bottling water took 1.7 billion liters of water in Ontario. And if, you can, and if we were to assume all of that went into 500 milliliter bottles, and if we, we know that a little bit of water is consumed in uh, the production of those bottles, that uh, Ontario produced 2.6 billion plastic bottles in 2017. And going back to your comment that less than 50% is recycled, that means that around 1.3 bottles wind up as litter or in landfill in Ontario. So what, uh, what do you see as the benefits? If we were to have a permanent moratorium on new permits to bottle water and we were to phase out existing permits to bottle water in Ontario, what would be the benefits of that? I mean, I think there could be a couple of things. One would be the obvious just reduction in the amount of plastic bottles that are being manufactured and filled in Ontario, regardless of whether those are actually consumed in Ontario or consumed elsewhere. They are definitely plastic um, that is ending up either in the environment, landfill or recycling. Like it's just great to turn off the tap as much as possible. Um, I also think though that uh, perhaps it would lead to a change in the way we think about access to water. So maybe we would see greater investments in refill stations. Um, you know, if folks are not consuming as much bottled water in single use plastic packaging, um, maybe we would have greater access to drinking fountains or um, water bottle refill stations in parks. And that's something that I'd really like to see more of. Ashley, the, uh... As well, as I mentioned, Wellington Water Watchers is calling for a permanent moratorium on new permits uh, to bottle water. The government has a moratorium in place. It's set to expire October 1st. Does environmental defense support a permanent moratorium on new permits to bottle water in Ontario? Yeah, for sure. I think that, um, 
you know, this is obviously an industry that doesn't need to grow. Um, Canadians and Ontarians, for the most part, are incredibly in, incredibly fortunate to have access to some of the safest, cleanest drinking water from their taps. And the communities that don't, um, which for the most part are Indigenous communities and other marginalized communities, I think that our priority needs to be finding better ways to get them high quality drinking water through infrastructure upgrades um, and to stop relying on bottled water as a band-aid solution. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for the presentation today. Thank you for the work you do and thank you for the work that environmental defense does. Right back at you, Mike. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. I think we're back and uh, we've got some questions in the chat box and I'm going to start off uh, with a question to you first, Ashley, which is um, can beverage containers be made from hemp? Um, I actually don't definitively know the, that specific answer. I will say that I am generally very, um, I'm very cautious about claims of bioplastics or biodegradable plastics or compostable plastics. Um, and the reason for that is um, a lot of bi bioplastics, first of all, is just generally a label that's given to plastics that are made from sources other than petroleum. Um, Dasani, a Coca-Cola water product, uh, likes to promote its plant bottle, which is made from a certain percentage of non-petrochemical feedstock, um, but they make it in such a way that it looks and feels for all of in terms of purposes, it is plastic. It's just regular PET, um, and it needs to be recycled like regular plastic. It isn't compostable. Um, and then some biodegradable or compostable materials are actually, um, spe specifically biodegradable materials. Biodegradable is a very broad term. Lots of things can be labeled as biodegradable. Um, anything can really biodegrade if you let it sit for long enough. A car can biodegrade if you let it sit for centuries. <laughs> um, and compostable, uh, most compostable plastics are not actually compostable in your backyard recycling systems um, and many municipal compost facilities will not accept them because um, besides the fact that they can like not necessarily break down as quickly as the other materials in the compost facility uh, because they look and feel so much like real plastic they're often actually just pulled off the line either by workers or machinery um, and sent to landfill anyway so unfortunately I think really what we need to be doing is reducing the overall amount of um, single-use packaging we're using period and then uh, just doing a better job of thanks Ashley um, I'm looking at the screen, okay. And Chelsea, um, one of the questions was about microplastics. If people are watering their garden with tap water that has microplastics in it, can the microplastics find their way into the garden vegetables? It's a good question, and it's one that scientists are actively working on. So we started studying this in, in the marine environment, then we started going into freshwater, and now we're looking into terrestrial soils. And so we know that the microplastic is in terrestrial soils. And of course, as you said, we know it's in the water. Um, and so people are trying to understand that, but I will say that the microplastics that would do that would have to be very small. So a barrier to understanding this question right now is the methodology. We're really good at, at quantifying microplastics down to about 10 micron, which is so much smaller than you were. It's smaller than the size of one human hair. So it's very small. Um, but the amount that probably would get into a vegetable is even smaller than that. And so we're really working on these methods. And I, I see literature come out every day to, to better answer this question. Maybe a related question, uh, Chelsea, is, um, is there technology to take microplastics out of drinking water? Is it something that can be, that is or can be in treatment centers? Yeah, or in our homes, right? So, I mean, at the at the the way water is treated, to the best of my understanding, is often we try to settle out these particles, and then it might go through an extra filtration at the end. Um, but if it goes through, so for example, when we treat wastewater to drink it, it goes through an RO or a reverse membrane um, filter. 
that should filter out microplastics. If you put an RO system in your own home, that's another way to clean your microplastics right directly at your source as it comes out of the tap. I'm wondering whether we, oh, there's Ashley, we'd lost you there for a moment. Okay, so this next question you might both want to speak to, and uh, maybe Ashley will give you a chance to go first if you have a comment. Do you think that the heightened awareness of microplastics will spur much greater testing on all water impurities? Like, do you see something happening here uh, that testing for water impurities in, in public drinking water systems is going to change or be, be moved to some other level because of the microplastic concern? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I do think that there is going to be, and there already is increasing public pressure to have microplastics be something that we do test for. I think when those um, studies kind of, there were some public studies that came out a couple of years ago, really talking about the idea of the amount of microplastics in bottled water and tap water. Um, and I think since then it's become a much more common narrative in the public. Um, but I also am hesitant to think that that would really force the government's hand to move beyond testing for just microplastics. I would say in my experience as a campaigner, I very rarely see government um, move to kind of do more than they're being asked to do. And so I think if it's important to us to have other um, uh, attributes or chemicals or whatever being monitored in water, then there should probably be additional advocacy calls for that. You want to add to this, Chelsea? Um, yeah, but I want to make sure I understand the question first. Was your question about whether or not there would be policies to start uh, monitoring and regulating microplastics in drinking water or whether it would change policies to quantify and regulate other chemicals? Because I think I saw it as the first. Uh, yeah, I think actually, it's a little, yeah, I'd say the second. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. So speak okay. to whichever one. I can only you. speak to the first. <laughs> and I fully agree with Ashley's answer on the second. Um, for the first one, so I, what I can say is in, in the state of California, which of course is not here, um, they have now a bill that's been passed that says they must monitor microplastics in drinking water. They have to define what microplastic is for this purpose, then they have to come up with a method, and then they need a threshold for health. I'm helping um, kind of advise on the how do you define it, how do you create that method, and, and what's the threshold for health, and there are people from our Canadian government going to these meetings. So I think that because of reports coming out from the World Health Organization about microplastics in drinking water, that yes, I do think we will be measuring uh, microplastics in drinking water in the, mun in the municipalities um, in the next five to 10 years, if not less. Okay, a different question, and again, uh whichever of you feels moved to speak to this, a uh, person is wondering if there's a solution to the lack of clean drinking water on First Nations communities, which doesn't involve plastic water bottles. Yes. <laughs> and the solution is to actually invest in the infrastructure that's required to invest in the water treatment facilities. Um, if First Nations communities are living in close enough proximity to um, other municipalities that have existing drinking water systems to get that water to those communities as well. I think for too long we have relied on bottled water as a solution, um, but it should only ever have been a band-aid solution while the infrastructure was being built. And I think even um, in other emergency situations we see, I know when there's like fires or floods, a lot of uh, bottled water companies love to kind of show up at those disaster sites with their um, skids of bottled water and be like, hey, look at the amazing contribution we're making. Um, and, you know, emergency situations are probably situations where we do need to have some form of uh, movable water coming with us into a community. But there are ways to do that that don't involve a bazillion tiny plastic bottles, having larger water tanks um, available available for people to fill buckets or their own bottles. Um, we see that in smaller scales at music festivals. Um, the City of Toronto has like a water tap kind of truck that it takes to street festivals and you bring your own bottle and you fill it up as opposed to them selling or providing bottled water. Um, so I do not think that we need to have individual bottles of plastic 
uh, to be meaningfully addressing First Nations water issues. Um, Ashley, I think you may have spoken to this in your presentation, but someone's asking, so there may be an update comment you want to make. What's the status of either the provincial or federal plans to reduce plastics, specifically for single-use plastics and the definition of single-use? Right. So just before COVID, um, word on the street was we were a couple of weeks away from the federal government announcing its preliminary ban list. So what the, I think there were maybe like six to eight items that they were going to move ahead, um, single-use plastics and ban. And then COVID happened. <laughs> and that put, um, it seems like a huge pause on everything. Uh, as recently as a few weeks ago, I saw an article where Minister Wilkinson, who is the Federal uh, Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada, had stated that the federal government still very much plans to move ahead on um, the commitments it's made to banning some single-use plastics and regulating plastics throughout um, the life cycle in other ways. But I think the soonest we would see something like that is the fall. And I'll tell you that environmental defense is a little bit nervous about wanting to make sure that those commitments become a reality. And so we actually have a petition going right now on our website, um, calling on Minister Wilkinson to make true on his commitment and uh, to ban some single use plastics and put in place all the other regulatory actions that would help reduce the amount of plastic we create and the plastic waste we generate. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, I think we've got one question left that we haven't answered. Uh, in the chat box, you'll notice that, there that uh, Dr. Rockman answered some questions, and there's also been useful commentary by participants on uh, different aspects of the questions and providing links. And uh, this uh, is being recorded, and um, the chat box will be part of the recording so that people can refer back to that. And the items that are linked, we're going to put together into a resource and make available and send you by an email later. So I'm going to ask uh, one more question from the chat box. I'm going to ask one more question of my own, and then I'm going to start to take us into wrapping up, if that's okay. Uh, somebody says here, I'm going to direct this to you, uh, Chelsea. Uh, I own a beach, and it's full of plastic particles. What's the best way to screen the particles out? Literally screens? That's the question. Yeah. I mean, a beach, like an actual beach? Um, I don't know what it means to own a beach. That sounds impressive. It was the first thing I would say. Um, and the second thing I would say, I wouldn't, that's, I, that's an incredibly arduous task. And um, I think it's better for us to try to turn it off um, at the tap, no pun intended. And I'm not just talking about water um, in, order to, in order to really take care of it. Because if we do do this with screens, it will come back. And actually, you know, in this reminds me, I used to do work down in the Tijuana River Valley in, in Southern California, and um, they, they were doing this because they they take sediment out of this area where they were coming in from the river and could potentially cause um, damage because there was so much sediment that so they would try to screen them for microplastics and other things, and then and then put them on the beach. Um, and it, I can tell you, it's not easy. So. Um, I applaud the question, but I think it's better that we change some of these policies and um, how we use these materials. I would love to echo that. I think that's so important. I think we way too often talk about what we can do at the end of the tap, like at the end of the pipe, what we can do to get this stuff out of the environment. And the focus needs to be not letting it get into the environment in the first place. Okay, Ashley, I'm now gonna uh, ask you a leading question. And the leading question is for you because it's, an, uh, it, it's one that, does, that requires an advocacy-related response. And as I ask the question slowly, I'm going to invite people who are watching that they may want to add their own answers to the chat box too. And the question goes like this. Why does the Ontario government allow corporations to manufacture disposable plastic and yet not be responsible for the waste and the pollution it creates. Why does the government let corporations do that and get off the hook? Uh, because the corporate voice is loud. Um, at least that's part of the reason I think. Uh, corporations have money, lots of money to pay lobbyists to be in there talking to elected officials all the time. Um, to be telling the story of uh, job creation or uh, maintaining existing job supply of consumer demand. 
Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, advocacy, um, being engaged politically as a citizen is incredibly important. You know, I think not to like get up on my soapbox, but I think too many of us think that being part of a democracy means voting once every four years, but really being part of a democracy means continuing to stay engaged in decisions that are being made about um, your life, the environment, the lives of other people in your community. Um, and you have a responsibility to continue to connect with your elected officials about issues that are important. And so if you feel that um, the commodification of water is not okay, if you feel that um, the overuse of plastic by companies and its like wanton disposal in our environment is a problem, then email your MP, email your MPP. As a matter of fact, go a step farther, call them because they are far more responsive to folks that call than form letters. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that there's a huge opportunity for us to kind of create a real groundswell of, um, we need, we need to fight the lobbyists ourselves. We need to be the people talking to uh, these elected officials instead. So get out there and call your elected officials. Thank you, Ashley. Never be shy about getting up on your soapbox. We like it when you get up on your soapbox. Uh, Ashley and uh, Chelsea, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, this has been excellent information you've given us. Uh, it's educated us and it's inspired us and we'll be able to make it available to people to continue to share with others and spread the word. Um, you know, where we are right now is that the, and with respect to Nestle water bottling and other bottled water companies in Ontario, the moratorium on new permits to bottle water has been extended to October 1st. It was originally passed in 2016 by the Liberals, it's been extended twice by Doug Ford's government. And frankly, it's been extended because of the kind of advocacy that Ashley has described. It's been the kind of pushing and calling and demonstrating that has made that happen. And although the physical distancing rules of COVID make it a little harder for us to be in the street, there's still lots of ways for us to put pressure on this government. Um, and we need to put a lot of pressure on them between now and October 1st. You know, at the Water Watchers, there's four major reasons that we oppose Nestle's water bottling. One is because, as, uh, because water is sacred and should never be a commodity. Um, that it produces plastic pollution that Nestle is profiteering uh, from a public good. And finally, it's uh, inconsistent with the, with the wishes of uh, First Nations communities, Indigenous peoples who have uh, a right to consent on the use of their land and water and who were not respecting their treaty rights. So for all those reasons, we're opposed to Nestle continuing to bottle water. And we're doing a series of webinars on each of these topics. This webinar has been on the question of plastics and microplastics. And thank you very much for helping us have this very effective day. Um, just to kind of come back to Ashley's advocacy comment, it's really important to know that Nestle will never change. It's a predator and a profiteer. That's their DNA, that's their motivation, that's their self-interest, their bottom line. And as the bottled water uh, story of bottled water video at the beginning told us, they manufacture the need while creating profits for themselves and garbage and pollution and health risks for us. The government must stop uh, giving permits to take water for bottling in Ontario. Um, and the combined health and climate emergency make it even more important to ensure that water is a public good and not privatized through bottling. The climate change is going to make water become, supply become less certain. And the COVID uh, pandemic tells us that uh, water and the availability of clean water is vital to public health. I think our uh, Megan and Danny are going to put up a slide right now that uh, describes some uh, actions that you can take. And then we're going to send this out to you afterwards by email so you can follow up and have the links. Uh, environmental Defense is, is launching in early July a campaign to um, uh, extend the moratorium. Uh, we're, we're working with them. There'll be other organizations. The Council of Canadians Wilderness Committee will all be joining together to amplify these demands leading up until October. The, this is part of a broader campaign that the Water Watches is launching called the People's Water Campaign. 
and which will culminate in a convention in September. Uh, we're getting broad-based support. We're very pleased in particular, for example, with the support we're getting from the Sisters of St. Joseph who are supporting our campaign, uh, Bishop Crosby in the Hamilton Diocese of the Catholic Church, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, and the Catherine Donnelly Foundation. So there's a broad support here for uh, these efforts. Uh, we invite you to take the actions that are here. Uh, as I said, we're gonna be sending you a follow-up email uh, to sign up for uh, the People's Water Campaign and to get information about that and to um, join us for the convention. There's gonna be a series of activities between now and September, these water webinars on a variety of topics. We're reaching out to a broad range of uh, groups who are involved in water advocacy on, in Ontario. Uh, and we'll be gathering input. And while there are, is an immediate need to focus on a set of priority demands uh, during the next two years in the lead up to the next provincial election and to push this provincial government to restore environmental protections to protect water, while that's an urgent set of priority demands, we also need to come together towards a longer term agenda for water justice. And we'll be gathering input from people uh, to prepare a draft declaration for water of justice to bring to that convention in September. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for all you do. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Rockman and Ashley for being with us. Thank you for your organizations and the work that you do. Thank you everybody today for your interest. We'll be in touch and uh, we'll see you next time.